Mic check one two one two. Mic check one two one two. All right. Hopefully, uh, somebody can hear me out there. Um, but welcome back to the Black Brain Trust. This is episode two three five. Space and technology. Please hit the like button as you come in. Share the video if possible. Dock it in the description beneath the video for you to follow along with. And as usual, um, still doing the mentorship, IT mentorship. So if you want to be mentored, you know, um, definitely um, hit us up or, uh, you know, leave a comment after the uh, stream is over and um, one of us will get back to you, um, if not myself, because uh, I'll be the one doing the IT mentorship. Uh, we do have uh, other members who can do it as well. So, And <clears throat> just to give you guys... Um, An excuse as to why I was late. Uh, stopped over Kendra D's, uh, chopped up some game with um, her panel and uh, talking about reparations. So definitely uh, check out Kendra D if you get a chance. Um, you know, peace to her for having me on the panel. And um, it's always a pleasure to do business over there, intellectually speaking. Um, give you guys another 90 seconds to come in here and. Uh, Fill up the chat. Black Scorpion, what's going on? I hate to get started, you know, um, prematurely before you guys uh, actually fall into the chat because it's not fair that you have to play catch up. So, All right, um, I'm chilling, Black Scorpion, man, chilling, man. Uh, the week is good, man. The weather's good. You know, we got a good docket tonight. Um, hopefully, uh, some of the other brain trust members will join the panel, um, help co-facilitate this. All right. Give you guys a couple more seconds to come in. About 8.20, we'll get started. Also, we um, we crack the golden number of 1.5K subscribers. So um, shout out to us for... Um, breaking 1,500 subscribers. We um, originally intended the channel to be um, around 250 to maybe 300 subscribers, and uh, we ended up scaling up to 1,500 uh, uh, 1, uh, um, subscribers. So we're doing it. Didn't expect to get this far. We didn't anticipate uh, this many subscribers. So this is where we are. All right, let's get started, man, because uh, I'm not going to wait all night for this. All right, this first article is from TechCrunch.com. Ethiopia's bid to become an African startup hub hinges on connectivity. Ethiopia is flexing its ambitions to become Africa's next startup hub. The country of 105 million with the continent's seventh largest economy is revamping government policies, firing up angel networks, and rallying digital entrepreneurs. Ethiopia currently lags the continent's tech standouts like Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa that have become focal points for startup formation, venture capitalists, and exits. To join these ranks, the East African nation will need to improve its internet environment largely controlled by one uh, one government owned telecom last week ethiopia's government shut down the internet for the entire nation ethiopia has the workings of a budding tech scene much of it was on display recently at the country's first startup ethiopia event held in addis ababa on the startup front 
Ride Hall Ventures, Ride and Zay Ride have begun to gain traction, uh, Uber has not yet entered Ethiopia. Their cars are visible buzzing uh, throughout the capital, and Zay Ride will expand to into Liberia in August. CEO Haptumu uh, Tadisi uh, confirmed to TechCrunch. While in Addis, I downloaded and used Ride, founded by female entrepreneur Summerall uh, Fikru, which quickly flashed connections to nearby drivers on, on my phone and allowed for cash payment. This month's Ethiopia, uh, this month's startup, Ethiopia, was showcased uh, high, showcase high potential early stage ventures such as payment company Yenapay and online food startup uh, Demat. Yenapay has worked to build digital payments imprint in Ethiopia's largely cash based economy. The startup has onboarded more than 500 merchants, including Zayride, according to co founder Nur Nurminser. Demat, uh, Demont. Uh, blends e-commerce and ag tech. We collect small holder farms with consumers. People who people can use their phones, pay with their phones, get any kind of agricultural products they want, and we deliver. Co-founder Kisanet Holly told me after pitching to judges that included Nigerian angel investor uh, Tommy uh, Davies and Cellulant uh, CEO Ken um, Noroji. That's a picture of uh, one of the one of the tech hubs. Ethiopia has several organizing points uh, for startup, venture capitalists, and developer activity. Tech tech talent and startup marketplace Jibia is located in Addis Ababa, with offices globally and offers programs and services for ventures and tech professionals to gain developer skills and scale their digital businesses. Blue Moon is an Ethiopian uh, ag tech incubator and seed fund. Its founder, Lini Agabre Martin, has extensive experience working abroad and played a central uh, convening role in the debut startup Ethiopia event. She's gorgeous. In terms of a developer and co co working type spaces, Ethiopia has ICOG Labs, an AI and robotic research company, and ICE, ICE Adis, or ICE Adis, one of the country's first tech hubs founded in 2011. ICE Adis' mission is to develop Ethiopia's IT ecosystem. Co founder and CEO Marcos Lima told me during a tour. The hub runs programs such as ICE 180, a six-month startup accelerator boot camp that has graduated 40 ventures. ICE Adis also offers a 24-hour co-working space with internet access for techies and startups that want to burn the midnight oil. Angels and Mentors. Startup, startup Ethiopia featured two angel and support networks for Ethiopia startups. Tommy Davies and Ethiopian diaspora returnees Shem As Asuf Asafa announced the first Adi Sababa Angel Network, supported by African Business Angels Network, which is expected to accept startups this year. Let me get down to the uh, business. The biggest hurdle for Ethiopia startup community is the situation with local internet. Mobile and IP connectivity is in the country is managed by state-owned Ethio Telecom, uh, though the government, led by newly elected Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and President uh, Sali uh, Work Zuidi, has committed to uh, privatize it. At Startup in Ethiopia, I moderated and sat on panels with Ethiopian government representatives to discuss the country's net situation. This was a this was the backdrop of the tech events, Wi-Fi not functioning properly over two days, something that 
was uh, readily pointed out during Q&A by Ethiopian techies and Liquid Telecom CTO Ben Roberts, who flew in from Nairobi. Several officials, such as State Minister of Innovation and Technology, Jamel Becker, named specific commitments to improve the country's internet quality, access, and cho choice within the next year. Ethiopia's Ministry of Innovation and Technology, Gedehan Mikura, seated, seated in the front row. Shortly after the officials made these public pledges, the government shut down the country's internet to coincide with national exams. Wow. So, I don't want to read this whole thing because I think you, you guys are getting bored, but basically... Ethiopia's issue isn't so much of electricity, but more about um, sparse connectivity. And I don't know how much fiber has been rolled out in Ethiopia, but um, judging by the way the sounds is that uh, there's a lot of old copper um, being used um, over, over the wire, and it's not um, it's not sufficient for for their um, you know for the tech startup uses. So. Uh, that's something to keep in mind when you, if you ever decide to go to the continent. Let me check the chat real quick. Aviteo, what's going on? Um, Steep Technologies, hey, what's going on? Welcome. Uh, Luis. Cabrera, um, why no super chat? Uh, we're a nonprofit, so if you want to contribute, you have to contribute intellectually. So intellectual contributions are only accepted. Triple X, what's going on, man? Peace. Conflictus, uh, peace. So that's what's going on right now. Um, Africa is still in the development stages, so you got to keep in mind that um, a lot of what we talk about, um, it's in the early stages of tech development. And if you anybody who's been using computers long enough, you know that back in the day they had something called Netscape. Well, guess what? Netscape is no longer. So that's how far back it you know it goes. All right, let me get to this next one. Um, share my screen again. Hey, Triple X, if you want to get on the panel, man, um, you know, send, send me an email if you have my email. I think you should have it. All right, this next one is from physics.org. Machine learning unlocks mysteries of quantum physics. This should be interesting. Understanding electrons' intricate behavior has led to discoveries that transform society, such as the revolution in computing made possible by the invention of the transistor. Today, through advances in technology, electron behavior can be studied much more deeply than in the past, potentially enabling scientific breakthroughs as world-changing as the personal computer. However, the data these tools generate are too complex for humans to interpret. A Cornell-led team has developed a way to use machine learning to analyze the, ge the data generated by scanning tunnel mic microscopy STM. a technique that produces uh, subatomic scale images of electronic uh, motions in material uh, surfaces at varying energies, providing information unattainable by any other method. Some of these images were taken on, on materials that have been deemed important and mysterious for two decades, said uh, Inua Kim, professor of physics, you wonder what kind of secrets are buried in those images. We would like to unlock those secrets. Kim is a senior author of machine
machine learning in electronic quantum uh, matter imaging experiments, which is <clears throat> which published in Nature June 2019 or June 19th. First authors are Yi Zhang, formerly a postdoctoral researcher in Kim's lab, and now at uh, Peking University in China, and Andre Masaros, a former do postdoctoral researcher in Kim's lab, now at University of Paris, uh, Sud in France. Co authors include JC. Uh, Samuels Davis. The researcher yielded new insights into how electrons interact and showed how machine learning can be used to drive further discovery in experimental quantum physics. At the subatomic subatomic scale, a given sample will include trillions, trillion, trillions of electronic electrons interacting with each other in the surrounding infrastructure. Electrons' behavior is determined partly by the tension between their two competing tendencies to move around associated with kinetic energy and to stay far away from each other associated with repulsive interaction energy. In this study, Kim and collaborators set out to discover which of these tendencies is important, to this, uh, important in a high-temperature superconductive material using uh, STM, elect electrons tunnel through a vacuum between the conducting tip and of the microscope and the surface of the sample being examined, providing detailed information about the electron's behavior. The problem is when you take data that data like that and record it, you get an image like data. But it's not a natural image, like an apple or a pear, Kim said. The data generated by the instrument is more like a pattern, she said, and about 10,000 times more complicated than a traditional measurement curve. We don't have a good tool to study those kinds of data sets. To interpret this data, the researchers simulated an ideal environment and added factors that would cause changes in electron behavior. They then trained an artificial neural network, a kind of artificial intelligence, that can learn a specific task using methods inspired by how the brain works to recognize the circumstances associated with different theories. With the researchers input the experimental data into the neural network, it deemed it, it determined which of these theories, which of the theories the actual data most resembled. This method, Kim said, confirmed the hypothesis that the repulsive interaction energy was more influential in the electron's behavior. So, um, I don't want to read this whole thing because it's, um, it's, it's really, really, really deep and it's too deep to be uh, read out loud. Um, you really got to read it to yourself to really understand. But um, the, the idea of using machine learning is so that you don't you take away the human labor and you allow the machine learning to actually do do the 99% of the labor and then the 1% is where you try to um, draw your own conclusion uh, based on what the findings are that the machine learning uh, was able to discover. And the only way the machine learning can understand this is if you, create, you take the electrons that are being generated and create these small data sets that will make up a, blot, a blotted image. Um, and excuse me for one second. All right, so getting back to what I was saying, um, the machine learning uh, will take the blotted images, the small blotted images, and create this big, one big image. However, uh, the human eye can't ever interpret it, nor can the human brain interpret it on its own, so the machine learning will do all of the work for you. Um, and the neural networks will act just like a human brain, uh, which is an extension of machine learning and artificial intelligence would actually do a lot of the labor for you. So it's important that um, people who are listening to this actually get into machine learning, get into Python, because that's what's driving a lot of this.
but this is definitely good stuff. This is like um, carbon data. This is like carbon data uh, um, uh, recordings. If you if you ever you know looked at um, how scientists uh, do forensics testing and, and things of that nature for um, dinosaurs and other uh, prehistoric um, um, uh, animals and beings. So, hey, complex design, what's going on, man? Um, so using machine learning for that aspect, man, it has so many advantages. Uh, and we talked about this before, but NVIDIA has a chip out um, that basically, uh, it, they have it in kit format now. It's about 100 bucks. Uh, you, you can't really beat it. We did an article covering it, um, and it's called the Jetson Nano. And what the Jetson Nano is, is it basically is a, um, a turnkey solution for um, developing artificial intelligence and machine learning and neural networks. And what you can do with that is is actually run um, simulations like we like we just discussed here with um, electrons um, uh, um, behavior. So invest that hundred bucks into that Jetson Nano. Um, it's it's going to be worth it. It's going to pay off dividends. If you have an NVIDIA graphics card, you could do the same exact thing. Uh, but it's going to be a lot more expensive. But that's those are the those are the hardware pieces that you're going to need. Hey, what's going on, with John? Um, let me get to this next article. I'm surprised we got a thumbs down already. Interesting. We got twenty. Seven people watching and only 20 likes. If you're not going to participate in the chat, you know, just hit the like button. Um, it's much appreciated. All right, this next article is from Ars Technica. The fourth industrial revolution emerges from AI and Internet of Things. AI, we just discussed that in the uh, physics.org article. Let's see if I can make this bigger. Big data analytics and machine learning are st starting to feel like anonymous buzzwords or business words, but they are not. Sorry, they are not. Uh, over overused abstract concepts. Those buzzwords represent huge char changes in much of the technology we deal with in our daily lives. Some of the some of those changes have been for the better, making our interaction with machines and information more neural and more powerful. Others have developed companies uh, tap into consumer relations consumers relationships. The, uh, behaviors, locations, and innermost thoughts in powerful and often disturbing ways. And the technologies have left a mark on everything from our highways to our homes. It's no surprise that the concept of information about everything is being aggressively applied to manufacturing contexts. Just as they transform consumer goods, smart, cheap, smart, cheap, sensor-laden devices paired with powerful analytics and algorithms have been changing the, the industrial world as well over the past decade. The Internet of Things have arrived, has arrived on the factory floor with all of the force of a giant electronic Kool-Aid man exploding through a cinder block wall. Tagged as Industry 4.0, this fourth industrial revolution has been unfolding over the past decade with its with fits and starts, largely because of the massive cultural and structural differences between the information technology that fuels the change and the operational technology that has been at the heart of the industrial automation for decades. As with other marriages of technologies and artificial intelligence, the potential payoffs for Industry 4.0 are enormous. Companies are seeing more precise, highly higher quality manufacturing with lowered operational costs, less downtime because of predictive maintenance and intelligence in the supply chain, and fewer 
injuries uh, on factory floors because of more adaptable in- equipment. And outside the outside of the factory, other industries could benefit from having nervous systems of sensors, analytics to process lakes of data, and just-in-time responses to emergent issues, aviation, energy, logistics, and many other businesses that rely on reliable, predictable things could also get a boost. But the new way comes with comes with significant changes, not the least of which which are security and, re- and resilience of the networked and nervous systems, uh, stitching all of this new magic together. When human safety is on the line, both the safety of the workers and people who live in proximity to the industrial sites, those concerns can be easily can be as easily set aside as mobile application updates or operating system patches. And then there's always that whole robots are stealing our jobs thing. The truth is much more complicated, and we'll touch on that later this week. The term Industry 4.0 was coined by Akatech, the German government's Academy of Engineering Sciences, in 2011. National Roadmap for Use of Embedded Systems Technology intended as a way to describe industrial digitalization or digitization. The term was applied to make to mark the shift away from simple automation with largely standalone industrial robots towards network cyber physical strength systems. Information-based orchestration between systems and the humans working with them based on a variety of sensors and human inputs. So that's what fourth industrial revolution means. Basically, you're talking about embedded systems, collecting information, all networked together and automated. As a promotional document document for the uh, roadmap from the German Fed- Federal Ministry of Education and Research stated, machines that communicate with each other, inform each other about defects in pr- production process, identify and reorder scarce materials, inventories, this is the vision behind the industry 4.0. So fourth industrial revolution means automation, means that if your job is repetitive, it will be automated and you will be out of business very soon. In the industry 4.0 future, smart factories using additive manufacturing, such as 3D printing through selective laser uh, sintering and other computer-driven manufacturing systems are able to adaptively manufacture parts on demand direct from digital designs, sensors keep track of needed components and order them based on patterns of demand and other algorithmic uh, decision trees, making just-in-time manufacturing to a, uh, or taking uh, just-in-time manufacturing to a new level of optimization. Optical sensors and machine learning driven systems monitor the quality of the components with more consistency and accuracy than potentially tired and bored humans on the uh, product line. Industrial robots work in a synchronization with the humans adding more uh, delicate tasks or replace them entirely. Entire supply chains can pivot with the introduction of new products changes in consumption and economic fluctuation. And the machines can tell humans when the machines need to be fixed before they even break or tell people better ways to organize the line all because of artificial intelligence processing massive amounts of data generated by the manufacturing process. So I talked about that earlier. The vision had has driven a one 0.15 0.15 billion euro, approximately 1.3 billion dollars US European Union effort called the European Factories of the Future Research Association. Some of the Factory of the Future's efforts have been funded by the US government, in particular by the Department of Defense, which sees te- the technology as key to the defense ind- industrial base. The Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, has used research programs such as the Adaptive Vehicle Make Project to seed 
development of advanced information integrated manufacturing projects and continues to look at Industry 4.0, enabling technologies such as effective mach human machine teaming, the ability to the ability of machines to adapt and to work and work side by side with humans as part of as partners rather than as tools, and smart supply chain systems based on artificial intelligence technology, in an effort called Logics, researchers at Miter Corporation's Human Machine Social Systems Lab has also been working on ways to improve how robotic systems interact with humans. So the next step beyond uh, the fourth industrial revolution is to start adding chips to human beings and making them work, uh, making human beings work more efficiently uh, with algorithms inside the chip that are connected to your brain. But that's a whole nother whole nother uh, discussion to talk about. As part of that work, MITRE has partnered with several robotic startups, including American Robotics, which has developed a fully automated drone system for precision agriculture called Scout. The system is an autonomous, weatherproof unit that sits adjacent to the fields. All a farmer has to do is program in drone flight times, and the AI handles drone flight planning and manages the flight itself, as well as the collection and processing of imagery and data, uploading everything to the cloud as it goes. That level of autonomy allows pharmacists to simply look at data about the crop health and other metrics on the on their personal devices and then act as an act upon that data, selectively applying pesticides, herbicides, and other and additional fertilizers if necessary. With another some with some more machine learning uh juice, those ta those are tasks that could eventually be handed off to other drones or robotic farming equipment once patterns and rules of their use are established. Scout mirrors how human machine teaming could work in a factory with autonomous machines passing data to humans via augmented vision or other displays, letting humans make decisions based on their skills and knowledge of the domain, and then having humans and machines act upon the required task together. But that level of integration is still in its infancy. Anyways, this is two pages. I'm not going to read all of it because um, I think you guys get the gist of what fourth industrialization really means. And uh, this article is, does an excellent job at laying all this out. Um, you guys should actually take the time to read this after the Hangout is over because it's um, definitely dope. Let me read the chat real quick. Nate, what's going on? Terrence, what's good? Um, Marvin. Evans, what laptop would you recommend for machine learning? Would 16 gigs do? Yeah, 16 gigs is more than more than sufficient. Um, you definitely need something like an i5 processor or an AMD, um, one of the AMD uh, uh, Risen processors, if you can find one of those. Same thing with the hard drive. It makes sure that it's an SSD. SSD, you can't go wrong with that. Hey, what's going on, Christian? Yep, seven series. Yep, you can't go wrong with AMD at this point because the AMD processors um, are actually really uh, responsive to um, uh, machine learning and AI. Um, there's something about how they uh, design the chips that the the chip, the, uh, the, um, the the AI development, machine learning development, neural networks seem to respond really good to um, AMD chips. Yeah, now's the time to actually build your computer before the uh, 
the tariffs on all of these parts and goods that come out of China and, and Southeast Asia actually go up because that's eventually that's going to happen in the next uh, 30 days or so. All right. All right, let me get to this next article. All right, this one is from Stat News. What if AI in healthcare is the next asbestos? Should be interesting. Boston, artificial intelligence is often hail. Let me see if I can zoom this in. Hailed as a great catalyst of medical innovation, a way to find cures to diseases that have confounded doctors and make healthcare more efficient, personalized, and accessible. Sorry, I just got distracted. Um, but what if the what if it turns out to be poison? John, Jonathan Zittrain, a Harvard Law School professor, posed that question during a conference in Boston. Today, that examined Tuesday, uh, that examined the use of AI to accelerate the delivery of precision medicine to ma to the masses. He used an alarming metaphor to explain his concerns. I think of machine learning kind of uh as asbestos he says it turns out that all it turns out that it's all over the place and even though at no point did you explicitly install it and it has possibly some latent bad effects that you might regret later after it's already too hard to get get it all out in healthcare Zitrain said AI is particularly problematic because of how easily it can be duped into re reaching false conclusions. As an example, he showed an image of a cat that a Google algorithm had correctly categorized as a tabby cat. On the next slide was a nearly identical picture of the cat with only a few pixels changed, and Google was 100% positive that the image on the screen was a guacamole. This is a front. This is a frontline system installed across the world uh, for image recognition, and it can be tricked that easily. The train said, "Okay, so now let's put this in the world of medicine. How do you feel when the algorithm spits out with 100% confidence that guacamole is what you need to cure your uh, cure what ails you?" He was part of a panel that explored the pitfalls of applying AI in medicine and the many ethical, political, and scientific questions that must be addressed to ensure its safety and effectiveness. Excuse me. Here's a look at the key points discussed during the event at Harvard Medical School. Algorithms have shown an ability to analyze vast amounts of data from wearables to flag the onset of health problems such as irregular heart rhythms or tremors that could indicate the onset of Parkinson's disease. But the wearable data are not the same as numbers on a spreadsheet. They can't be easily uh, anonymized, said Andy Caravos, chief executive of Electra Labs, a company seeking to identify biomarkers and digital data to improve clinical trials. How many people here think you can you could de-identify your genome? She asks. Probably not because your genome is unique to you. It's the same with the most of the biospecimens coming off a lot of wearables and sensors. I am uniquely identifiable with 30 seconds of walk data. That poses a privacy dilemma that is playing out on a daily basis as health tech companies compile more data on their customers. Caravo said few, if any, meaningful regulations have been developed surrounding the collection of these data or the algorithms being used to analyze them for healthcare. But if algorithms are the few drugs, she said, 
shouldn't they be regulated with the same rigor? If you think about digital therapeutics, they all have a certain mechanism for action, of action. She said, if there, is there an argument with what we've learned in the healthcare, in healthcare to look at uh, digital treatments in the same way we look at drugs? It is a question that will be answered by, by entrepreneurs until, until and unless it is taken up by regulators. So I don't want to read this whole entire thing because I think the gist of this is that um, cybersecurity is still important. And I think that um, we have a couple of members on our who come on the Black Brain Trust who are involved in security and uh, systems administration and systems engineering. What, ha what they're talking about in this article is that um, data could be easily spoofed for AI to make um, a poor decision or a uh, bad decision through data malpractice. And data malpractice means that somebody's, somebody's tainting the data by um, injecting um, false or manipulated data in order for the artificial intelligence to make a wrong decision or a bad decision. Um, and in terms of medicine, in terms of the, uh, the um, medical industry, this is a big no-no. Um, so <laughs> you have uh, this artificial intelligence that's uh, trying to prescribe, you know, um, Coding to let's say a baby or something like that, you know that's that's a bad move or something, something like an opioid, um to to a uh, toddler that 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 would be a disaster and um, as it stands that's not something that we have really discovered yet from a cybersecurity standpoint I can probably say that um we can probably use blockchain to secure uh the authenticity of the data but um, what happens when you inject bad data into uh, a blockchain. It, just because it's on a blockchain doesn't mean it's 100% secure. Um, it's only as secure as the as the uh, the origin that it came from. So if you have bad guys who want to uh, force uh, dirty data or toxic data into a um, in, into a data set, then what happens here is that the whole data set becomes poisoned. And now the decision that the AI and the machine learning needs to make is is, is all poison as well, and it's no it's no longer uh, usable. So that that's that's where we are right now, and that's why uh, cybersecurity becomes important. All right, let me get to this next article. All right. This one is from technologyreview.com. The future of AI research is in Africa. In the latest in the last few years, the machine learning community has blossomed, applying the technology to challenges like food security and healthcare data, or healthcare. Sitting in a hotel lobby in Morocco, Charity Wayua laughs as she recounts her journey to the city for a conference on technology and innovation. After starting her trip in Nairobi, Kenya, where she leads one of uh, IBM, which she leads one of IBM's two research centers in Africa, she had to fly past her destination for a layover in Dubai, double double back to Casablanca, and then take a three and a half hour drive to uh, Tangier. What would have been seven to eight hour direct flight was instead a twenty four hour odyssey. This is not un this is not unusual, she says. The hassle of traveling within the region isn't the only thing making things difficult in Africa, uh, in Africa's research community. The difficulty of traveling out of the, uh, let me, um, I didn't realize it went behind the paywall. Let me see if I can spin this up again. So I can get this again. Oh. 
the hassle of traveling. Oh shoot, let me share my screen again. The hassle of traveling within the region isn't the only thing making things difficult for Africa's research community. The difficulty of traveling out of the region has often left its researchers out of the international conversation. While these issues have affected every scientific field, they are amplified in AI research. The pace of innovation means, for example, that repeatedly missing conferences over visa problems which have made it hard for African scientists to attend some of the world's largest AI events in the U.S. and Canada are easily uh, can easily cause a researcher to fall behind. Despite the odds of the, despite the odds, the African machine learning community has blossomed over the last few years. In 2013, a local group of industry practitioners and researchers began data science in Africa. An annual workshop for sharing resources and ideas. In 2017, another group formed the organization Deep Learning in in Daba, which now has 20, which now has chapters in 27 of the continent's 54 countries. University courses and other educational programs dedicated to teaching machine learning have begun in in response to increasing demand. The international community has taken note, has also taken note. In late 2013, IBM Research opened its first African office in Nairobi. It added another in Johannesburg, South Africa, in 2016. Earlier this year, Google had Google opened a new AI lab in in Ghana. And next year, ICLR, a major AI research conference, will host its first event in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So the shift is a positive for one one for the field, which has suffered from a lack of diversity and in many ways a detachment from the real world. Many of the academic and corporate research labs and that dominate AI research are concentrated in wealthy bubbles of innovation like Silicon Valley and China's uh in China's um Ziconic, outside of Beijing. That limited pure view shows in the scope of the products these hubs create. Africa, on the other hand, might offer a context with each, with which AI can return to its original promise, creating technology that tackles pressing global challenges like hunger, poverty, and disease. I think for anyone who's looking for tough challenges, says Wayu, this is the place to be. Both IBM research offices in Kenya and South Africa and Google's AI lab in Ghana share the same mission as their parent organizations to pursue fundamental and cutting edge research. They focus on issues like increasing access to affordable health care, making financial services more inclusive, strengthening long term food security, and streamlining government operations. The list is not unlike that for the lab located anywhere else in the in the world, but the context adds nuance to the objectives. Research cannot be uh, detached from the environment in which it is performed, says Mustafa Sisi, the dictate the, uh, the dictator, the director of Google AI Ghana. Being in an env- an environment where the challenges are unique in many ways gives us the opportunity to explore problems that maybe other researchers in in places in other places would not be able to explore. That's a picture of the uh, the gentleman that uh, was mentioned. Before bon- before founding its AI lab in Ghana. For example, Google began working with farmers in rural Tanzania to understand some of the struggles they face in maintaining consistent food production. The researchers learned that crop disease can significantly reduce yield, so they created machine learning model that could diagnose early stages of disease in the cassava plant, an important staple crop in the region. 
the model, which works directly on farmers' phones without the needing access to the internet, helps them intervene early, earlier to save their plants. Wayua gives another example. In 2016, the Johannesburg team at South and at IBM, sorry, the Johannesburg team at IBM Research discovered that the process of reporting cancer data to the government, which used it to inform national health policies, took four years after diagnosis in hospitals. In the U.S., the equivalent data collection and analysis takes only two years. The additional lag turned turn out to be due in part to the unstructured nature in, of the hospital's pathology reports. Human experts were reading each case and classifying it into one of the 42 different cancer types. But the free form text on the reports made this very time consuming. So the researchers went to work on a machine learning model that could label the reports automatically. Within two years, they had developed a successful prototype system, and they are now striving to make it scalable so it can be useful in practice. Technology is only half the equation, YUS says. The other half is being able to understand the problems that we see and being able to define them objectively in a way that science and engineering can address. CCNYU has shared similar career tra trajectories. Each left Africa for higher education before coming back, hoping to apply their skills in ways that would maximize their impact. CC would uh, work at Facebook in Europe while he waited for the right opportunity to return. Now both are deeply invested in developing more lo local educational opportunities with, uh, for youth interested in AI. CC founded and dissects the African Masters in Machine Intelligence, a one-year intensive program that operates learning uh, programs around the region and brings in some of the best AI researchers around the world. YU's lab hires high-performing undergraduates to work alongside full-time staff and pays for them to take the online master's uh, program in computer science offered by Georgia Tech University. The main resource for doing research is talented people, and you will find more talent in Africa than anywhere else, says CC, pointing to the dis disproportionately young population. The energy for tech here is just amazing. The question is, how do you equip those talented people with the skills so they can transform, so they can own the transformation of the continent and build their own future? When CC teaches his students in the master's program, he tells them that in five years time, they will be the ones leading the field and returning to, the, returning to teach the classes. Of, of this, he has no doubt. The future of machine learning research is in Africa, he says, whether people know it or not. So, um, I'm on the panel by myself again, I think. Uh, let me check, yeah. So um, as I we've we've been talking about this for over a year now. Um, anybody who who's involved in tech, anybody who's involved in the fourth industrial uh, uh, market, Yeah, anybody who's involved in the fourth industrial uh, industry um, or the industrialization um, and, emerge, and emerging tech, we've been talking about this uh, for quite some time, over six months now. And the problem is uh, ADOS people don't really understand how significant the, this article is. The future of AI is in Africa. The future of machine learning is in Africa. 
the future of uh, of um, human development is in Africa. You know, um, what's happening now is that uh, people are not. You know, when I say when I say people, I'm seeing people in the manosphere, the black manosphere. They're not taking this stuff seriously enough. And what's happening? Overall, the the conversation is being lost. As a matter of fact, it's not even being had to begin with. This this conversation is now leading to uh, a lot of growth opportunities. You see that these people were, were working to save up enough money so that they can go back and 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 um and promote their uh, and promote the um, the advancement of the tech of the emerging tech back home, whereas you know these discussions on uh, of ADOS. You know uh, it's interesting because they always just talk about uh, money. Um, they always just talking about this uh, the factor of going out and just making money and then not really giving back or not not doing anything philanthropic uh, with their um, with their resources. And and that's part of the reason why you don't have a whole lot of advancement in predominantly black neighborhoods in America. But if you read an article like this, you'll see. And we cover many articles like this you'll see that most of these Africans go right back and do do the due diligence and the work that needs to be done. Hey, Daryl Moore, welcome. Um, Gone to Warrior, what's going on? Andy, what's up? Yeah, um, yeah, what's up? What's going on? Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I talked about this earlier in the hangout that yeah you you got to got to work on machine learning there's a whole lot of um opportunity that's going to come from machine learning um buy yourself a Nvidia Jetson um Nano um it's 100 bucks you can't beat that uh for what it for what it's capable of doing and what machine learning can actually do and artificial intelligence can actually do and these neural networks and so on and so forth can actually do there's a lot that's going to come out of this Africa is 1.2 billion people right now it's going to scale up to at least 1.5 billion by by at least 2035 2040 what's going on castle dragon yeah um we we beat this drum for a long time and um you know people in the manosphere are not listening um if they are listening i don't i don't see these discussions being had uh as far as i can see we're the only channel actually having this conversation um People not taking this stuff seriously enough. I'm already in the tech industry, so it's not a big deal for me. But for a lot of other people who, you know, who come through here or, or who linger around the manosphere, they don't really understand the significance of what's being discussed. Um, and if you don't learn this type of stuff, um, you're going to get left behind. That's the only thing I can tell you. You will be left behind so far. It, it, it won't even be funny. It, it'll be game over. Um, because if you can't read the code, you can't write the code, you can't, you know, you don't understand, you know, you, you know the uh, the theory aspect of it, you know, intro to computer science, CS 101, those type of aspects, you're screwed. You are absolutely screwed. So I think it's a great article. That's why I put it on the docket. All right, let me jump to this next article. Yeah, Nate, um, you can use a Chromebook, um, but the problem with the Chromebook is that once you run too many tasks at a time, um, that, that thing's going to slow down. 
Um, so you got to be selective about what you're, what you're going to do with the Chromebook. If you're not going to run anything else in the background, you should be fine. But make sure you get a Chromebook that has an Intel processor to it um, so that you can have um, the Linux IDE installed. Because you're going to need it. All right. This next one is from nature.com. China reveals scientific experiments for its next space station. China has selected nine scientific experiments, including the project that will, show, will probe how DNA uh, mutates in space to fly on its first major space station, including scheduled to be completed in 2022. The China Man Space Agency selected the projects, which involve sci scientists from 17 nations, from 42 hopefuls, in a process organized with the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, UNUSA. China's existing space laboratory, Tiangong, Tiangong 2, which launched in 2016, also hosts experiments. But the new space station will be, will be bigger and is intended to last longer. Known as the China Space Station, the outpost will be less than one quarter of the mass of the International Space Station. The science projects cover similar topics to experiments that have flown on the ISS since the March 1998, including fluid and fiber and fire behavior uh, biology and astronomy. Scientists working on the projects hail from spacefaring uh, nations such as Russia, Japan, India, as well as low and middle income uh, countries, including Kenya, Mexico, and Peru. The result of the special efforts to encourage participation from space nations. The cooperation takes into account the special needs of developing countries. Where, which, were, which were encouraged to submit joint project applications with advanced countries, said Wang Quinn, uh, China's ambassador to the United Nations in Vienna, in a statement. The experiments include an Indian-Russian observatory called the Spectroscopic Investigations of Nebular Gas, Nebular Gas, which will map dust clouds and star-forming star regions of space using ultraviolet light. A group of European institutions, meanwhile, will study how microgravity and radiation in space affect the mutation of DNA in humans, organ organoids. 3D biological structures that mimic organs and a Saudi Arabian team will test how solar cells perform on the outside of the space station. Other winners include a detector called Polar 2, a more powerful follow-up to a sensor launch on Tiang, Tiangong 2 to study the polarization of energetic ray bursts from distant cosmic um, uh, phenomena. Polar 2, which will be built by an international collaboration, could even allow astronomers to observe the weak radiation associated with sources of gravitational waves. But none of these experiments came from the United States, which since 2011 has forbidden NASA researchers from collaborating with China without congressional approval. A spokesperson for UNUSA told Nature that U.S. scientists were eligible to take part and were involved in several applications, but those, app those projects weren't ultimately selected. The United, 
the United States is planning to cut its funding for the ISS from 2024 as it concentrates its space efforts on building an outpost in the moon's uh, orbit from 2022. This could mean that the Chinese space station becomes scientists' only laboratory in low Earth orbit from 2024. So, um, How I see this um, playing out is that China is consolidating all of the uh, uh, low to middle income countries, um, countries that may not make it to the G20, and they're leveraging those human resources and those human capital um, to get them involved in space development to advance them further in ways that the United States has not done yet. Typically, the United States only works with um, the five eyes, uh, which would be Canada and Britain and other uh, Anglo-Saxon countries. Now, what China is doing is the complete opposite. They're taking melanated countries such as Kenya, such as Mexico, such as Peru, a lot of your um, Latin American countries, a lot of your um, underrepresented countries in the G20, they're now getting a seat in, inside um, space research. They have Saudi Arabia on board now. Uh, if I remember correctly, UAE has also participated. Um, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of organic development happening that uh, many of these, um, many, many uh, people don't even realize is starting to happen. Um, China is, is trying to forge the way um, you know, for underserved and underrepresented countries. Um. All right, let me get to this next article. I mean, we've covered uh, space exploration at nauseum, and uh, we've been beating this drum for a minute that this is where the market is going. But if you listen to some naysayers, they'll sit up here and tell you that, um, you know, there's no such thing as space. Um, you know, don't use sciencey words with us. You know, I don't like sciencey words. You know, um, you know, they, you know, the Earth is flat. You know, all, all, all these sort of people. Who who are who's supposed to be ADOS, you know, or at least they claim to be, don't realize that other countries are starting to accelerate now, and you're not even a part of the, the discussions. Same thing with, you know, Africa being the new center of AI and machine learning. You're not even a part of that discussion. All right. Um, this next one is from Engadget.com. Japan will send a rover to Martian moons with help from Germany and France. Let me just blow this up a little. We might be able to study the Martian moons, Phobos and Demios, and Demios, a lot more closely in the coming decade. Japan Aerospace Explor Ex Exploration Agency has teamed up with Germany's France and space and France's space agency to send a spacecraft with a rover to the red planet uh red planet's faithful companions in fact jaxa has a has just finalized the, its agreements to work with the german aerospace center d l r on the study phase activities of for its martian moons exploration mission. DLR and France's National Center for uh, Space Studies will help uh, JAXA build, a, build and study a rover meant to explore one of the moons. The rover will, will fly strap to the MMX spacecraft, which will orbit both Phobos and Demios. According to new scientists, if all, according to, 
if all goes according to plan, the rover will become the first one to ever land on the minor body of in the solar system. In addition, Jackson's partnership with DLR also gives the opportunity to conduct experiments using the Bremen Drop Tower in Germany, a microgravity tower that gives scientists a way to test equipment in weightless conditions. Interesting. While JAXA is yet to decide on the rover's final destination, Tim Glotch, a planetary scientist from Stony Brook University in New York, told New York told new scientists, "My my guess is that they would go to Phobos unless there." with some kind of spacecraft engineering reason not to. Because it's a bigger target and has more gravity, taking a closer look at the moons will help us figure out where they came from and what their compositions are. Knowing what they are made of could be uh, crucial for future manned missions. They could, for instance, become a source of water for fuel. That could make it possible to carry less fuel in reach greater distances by using the moons uh by using the moons as a fueling station of sorts now that's that's really really interesting jackson is hoping to send the mmx mission to space in 2024 assuming it achieves that target launch date this the spacecraft will enter the martian orbit in 2025 it will then return to earth with samples from the moons in tow sometimes in sometime in 2029 this is um this is huge who just join me what's going on to go hey what's going on mike how you doing i'm oh, good brother yourself great 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 well you know as i said i was Lifting a little weights today, uh, and I kind of hurt hurt my right pectoral muscle lifting some heavy ass weights. So I think that's my body telling me I gotta ease back a little bit. <laughs> but outside of that, all is well. Mm-hmm. I hear you. Uh, yeah, but kind of interesting. Anything you want to add about the article? Uh, not, not a whole lot. I just was kind of interested because I know on Phobos, um, Buzz Aldrin, one of the astronauts went to the moon uh, said, you know, they've been looking at a lot of, you know, different satellites of planets and they found that um, there was some type of um, monolith structure that looks like they may see, it. It, it, who knows, it could be a giant crystal, they don't know, um, that's actually on Phobos, that, that's, that's pretty big, pretty huge, they've imaged it, they don't exactly know what it is and um, maybe we might get a chance to, if they're going to put rovers and stuff there, um, and use, I mean, I'm moving to the fueling station, at, which I think this is some talk that's been going on for quite some time. Um, that would be actually, would be brilliant, but kind of examine what else is there. Now, if that's a giant crystal or if it's something, you know, who knows what that might be, um, what would be the prospects of even mining these moons for possibly even, um, um, you know, other types of um, minerals and stuff like that that we might that might be in such abundance. You know, we, we might not be able to find this as much here on Earth. So that 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 might be just another interesting look at things. Not even so much that um, what might be there. You know, I'm talking about now the asteroid field where you may have to go out even a lot farther. We may not have to even go out that far, depending on what some of these things they might even find on some of these moons. So. Um, um, well, they're talking about using it as a uh, fueling station because it has the uh, specific amount of water enough for um, enough for uh, uh, launching to the next um, destination. Yeah, but what if we start to find other minerals that are there? What if we find minerals? What if we find things that, that you know? What if we find stuff that could be very useful to industry here mm-hmm. on the earth? I, it's just you know. I think it raises a, a, a lot of questions, and I'm and I'm primarily kind of on this monolith piece that um, it seems that you know that, that we've known for quite a while, and it looks like uh, this Arthur C. Clarke years ago, um, writing one of his books, seemed to take that to some other level. But uh, but yeah, I, I think you know, we definitely um, should be looking at these other areas, and I 
other planets, I mean, excuse me, other countries are going to be getting involved in dealing with planets and in their moons. And this is just, this is just what's, what's going to happen. So I think a lot of people are saying, hey, we're 20 years off, and 30 years off, and why are people even talking about that? I think it might be a lot closer than that. Closer than that. So I think this stuff is quite relevant to today. Yeah, 10, 10, 10 years off. Yeah. At least according to the article. Right. Mm-hmm. All right, let me get to this next article. All right, this one is from NDTV. Indian space startups on fundraising spree ignites investors' interest. The state-run Indian Space Research Organization, currently preparing for its second lunar mission, has a monopoly on launching rockets in the country. From companies building palm-sized satellites to those aiming to propel satellites into space using cleaner fuels, a new wave of Space technology startups are are mushrooming in India, catching the attention of investors keen to join the space race. Bengaluru-based Bellatrix Aerospace, which wants to propel satellites into orbit using electric and non-toxic chemical thrusters, has raised $3 million from a group of investors, co-founder Yasha Karanam, told uh, Reuters. Venture capital fund ID, IDFC Power Power is leading uh, Bellatrix pre-series A round. This, the family office of Suman Khan, Khan Manjal, who belongs to the billionaire family that controls motorcycle maker Hero Motorcorp and Topeka one of Bollywood's biggest stars, are two of the other seven investors. Meanwhile, Mumbai-based Kawa Space, which designs and operates uh, operates Earth observation satellites, has closed a seed round of an undisclosed amount. One of its investors, Vishish Rajaram, managing partner and special investor, told Reuters, Bellatrix and Kawa are two of over a dozen Indian startups developing satellites, rockets, and related support systems which can power space missions serving a range of industries. Their funding represents a big leap in private space investments in India, a leading space power, but where the government has enjoyed a near monopoly for decades. No venture capital firm which does tech investments in India has invested an amount of an amount of this size in space technology before. Besides Bellatrix and Kawa, even uh, seven space technology companies in India are funded, according to startup tracker uh, uh, tracking 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 sorry, and interviews with investors. Space technology is red hot, thanks partly to activity happening uh, 2,000 kilometers away above Earth in the low Earth orbit, much closer and easier to reach than the geostationary orbit where many communi- communication satellites operate. Here, small, cheaper, smaller and cheaper satellites are snapping images used in everything from crop monitoring and geology to defense and urban planning, bringing down costs and increasing the frequency of image. In the past five years, some two dozen Indian startups have grown into unicorns, companies with over $1 billion valuations, most betting on the country's growing middle class and other in the consumer boom at home. India space technology firms are part of a new breed of startups, and investors are paying attention given the surging global interest in everything from space exploration to space vacation. Satellites, satellite launches planned in the, in the coming years worldwide give investors confidence in such companies, said Bell, uh, Bellatrix investor Jat Desi, whose uh, Power Power Capital uh, co- collaborated with leader IDFC to form IDFC Power Power. Um, 
I'm not going to read all of this because uh, I think the gist here is that um, India sees the writing on the wall in terms of um, development. And the way they see it is that um, one in every three startups is going to be a space startup, like we have been saying before. So with that being said, um, not getting into the space exploration or the space race right now is is, is a um, you're, you're basically shooting yourself in the foot. There's other areas you can get into. You don't actually have to get into the launching of the vehicles, but developing the cube-based satellites, the nano-based satellites, um, you know, the communication systems, and so on and so forth is is actually pivotal as well. So, do you have anything you want to add to this? Uh, no, 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 I do not. Nope, no, I don't. Except, uh, you know, anything we'll see. No, except... <laughs> This is where things are going, and um, that's that we, that's why we should be talking about this and looking to really get more involved because this is where uh, you know the next big giant you know corporations are, are actually going to be going to be born, and um, it's, in, it's, in, it's anybody's go right now. Anybody's go. No one has a tremendous monopoly on this, um, so that's something that um, uh, we should be thinking about. And boy, it would be very wise for us to get involved in this now. All right, let me get to this next article. This is the last one on the docket. Let me see if I can roll this up. All right, this one is from DailyGalaxy.com. Saturn's um, Achilletus, a vast erupting ocean world favorable for life. And this is really... Uh, what's going on with this uh, con uh, this text future spacecraft missions will sample the plumes looking for signs of life many of which will be affected just by the eruption process and university of washington astrophysicist lucas uh, pfeiffer of plumes erupting hundreds of miles into space from the ocean through cracks in enceladus inc ice encased uh, surface Providing a tantalizing glimpse into the world, into the moon's sur uh, subsurface ocean that uh, might contain. So understanding the differences between the ocean and the poon now will be a huge leap down the road. Or a huge hope down the road, sorry. Scientists didn't know why Enceladus, Enceladus uh, is the brightest world in the solar system or how it related to its E-ring. Cassini found that both the fresh coating on its surface and icy material in the E-ring originate from vents connected to a global subsurface saltwater ocean that might host hydrothermal vents. Complex organic molecules have been discovered in the plumes. The data transmitted back to Earth by the Cassini Saturn orbiter, which ended its service above the ringed world on September 16, 2017. Enceladus is a small moon and ocean world almost 310 miles across. Its salty subsurface ocean is of interest because of the similarity in pH, uh, salinity, and temperature to the Earth's oceans. Plumes of water vapor and ice particles spotted and studied by the Cassini spacecraft erupting hundreds of miles into space from the ocean through cracks of Enceladus ice in case surf, uh, surface, providing a tantalizing glimpse into the, what the moon's subsurface ocean might contain, possibly providing conditions favorable to life. According to a new research from planetary scientists at the University of Washington, the presence of such high concentrations could provide fuel, a sort of chemical free lunch for living microbes, said lead researcher Pfeiffer, a uh, UW doctor, a doctoral student in Earth and Space Sciences. Or it could mean that there is hardly anyone around to eat it. 
The new information about the, comp the composition of Enceladus Ocean gives planetary scientists a better understanding of the ocean world's capacity to host life, Pfeiffer said. But Pfeiffer and colleagues around that, the plumes aren't chemically the same as the ocean from which they erupt at 800 miles an hour. The eruption process itself changes their composition. He was <coughs> composition. He is working with ESS faculty members David Caitlin and Jonathan Toner. They will present their work June 24th at the Astrobiology uh, Conference uh, 2019 in Bellevue. So that the work is supposed to be submitted today. Pfeiffer and colleagues say the plumes provide an imperfect window to the composition of Enceladus in global subsurface ocean and that the plume composition and ocean composition could be much different. That they find is due to plume uh, fractionization or fractionation or the separation of gases, which uh, preferentially allows some components of the plume to erupt while others are left behind. This in mind, the team returned to data from Cassini, uh, from the Cassini mission with a computer simulation that accounts for the effects of fractionization. To get, clean, to get a cleaner idea of the composition of Enceladus in, in the oceans, they found significant differences between Enceladus plume and ocean chemistry. Previous in, interpretations they found underestimate the presence of hydrogen, methane, and carbon dioxide in the ocean. So first thing is that there's something up there. The second thing is um, how do you get a sample of what what is up there to, to confirm what it, what it actually is that you think is in theory? Nicole, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, you have to go there. Um, you're also talking about, even though that's, it's, it's only a few hundred miles around, but the oceans are deep enough to where you're talking about it's going um, six or seven fathoms deep. So you're looking at these oceans that are exceedingly deep um, with salt water. So you know, we, know, we know pressures here on the Earth. We can go down 35,000 feet here, you know, deep to the deep of the Manianus Trench. We're talking about now oceans that may be going down to to three, you know, you know, I mean, excuse me, um, 35,000, now you're going down 100,000, 200,000 feet possibly um, under extreme pressures and who knows what's there, you know, also um, as far as, you know, there's a lot of radiation that's, that's there on the surface, but that radiation right. would be, um, would also be protected um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a water world. So there wouldn't be uh, that level of, um, of, of radiation as you, as, as you go deep into these oceans and we don't, we have bathospheres and so forth that we've developed to go down this deep, though I'm sure we could certainly engineer them. I don't think that would be a huge problem um, to do that. Um, we do know of plumes that exist um, on um, either Io and Europa, which we've seen that Europa now has plumes that go up um, uh, quite, a, quite a bit high, and they have fissures in the ground that are letting, uh, through the ice that are letting this... Uh, this, you know, you know, th these plumes go up, they go up and uh, go up in space. Where, you, where now that we were thinking that we would have to drop, you know, a um, a, a rover and have a nuclear kind of tip ball, which could produce a tremendous amount of heat to melt through the ice and get down and and go all the way through, and um, and then have like a little small bath or something inside of it that that could then be released to then look around and see what was going on down there. Um, but they're figuring now that they're just open fissures in the um, in, you know, on the surface that are actually throwing up plumes as well. Very radioactive at the very center. I mean, I mean at the very you know surface of the of of the moon. But yet, you know, um, that radioactivity would certainly be um, cut down massively um, because of the deep protections of of of, of, of the ice cover. Um, so that. Cellus and, and, and other plants, this is not the only um, moon that has, seems to have water worlds. Seems like there are quite a few, and water is very plentiful actually in our solar system. And when we look at planets 
like Jupiter and Saturn uh, in their atmosphere, there's a great degree of water as well. Um, of course, it's crystalline and, and, and so forth, but it's not, um, you know, it's not liquid, liquid oceans like ours, but under the proper conditions, you know, you, you, you would have water. Um, so these moons are, this is nothing strange. This is something that's going on. Do I believe that there could possibly be life in those oceans? I think if there's, if there's cyanated water, which a lot of salt, and then you have um, some of the chemical brew that we're talking about, uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and um, 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 molecules, and they can link up, you know, you, you know, you can, you know, I believe you, you can produce life. I, I think that that can happen. So is it possible that there's, you know, microbes or whatever that's there? I, I would say there's, there's a, there's a possibility, you know, maybe even a great one. Uh, and we have to look at how life developed here on earth and, um, look at its, its history and then how this evolved here, um, I don't think it would be an exceedingly unique process that we've had. I think this this could be something that could happen a lot around um, planets that have that that have water, or even planets that might be methane rich as well and have liquid methane, where um, and sulfur and so forth, where we have bacteriums here in our in our uh, on our own Earth that can live literally on sulfur and and and, and, and a methane as well. So, um, um, and we, we have them, we have it here on, on our own earth. So, so we know that this could, this could exist. So the prospects here are, are, are awesome. And I think we need to look at the only way you're going to find out what's going on on, on, on that moon or IO or, or, or Europa or a, you got to land something there. You got to drop something there and, um, and, and, and then, then examine the, um, the, the, the environment. We can speculate, which is cool, but just like the, um, the, the Russians did with respect to planet Venus when they started landing, you know, you know, um, probes on Venus, they saw just from the outside of what they considered to be a very violent, very, um, a very hot planet from what they could pick up, um, from, from its sensors. But then as we, as they dropped a, um, a, a Martian vehicle or, or, or Martian, or, or excuse me, not a Martian, but, but, but a Venusian lander there and um, was able to gather information before it burned up and we saw exactly what it was with the hellish, hellish world. That looked like it might have had oceans on it before. That looked like there might have been water there before. That it might have had oceans until the environment changed. So if we're looking at, and we see that with Mars, so we're, we're even looking at three planets in our own solar system, um, Venus, Mars, and the Earth, that look like they all possibly had oceans um, at some point in time. We currently still have, but it looks like um, Venus may have had it, and then their environment turned into a massive greenhouse effect for whatever reason. Um, and look like it seems like we've got fairly decent evidence that Mars, that Mars didn't still has some some, some some water there, um, but the oceans are gone and the atmosphere is very thin. So um, you know what, what created those conditions for that? We don't know, but like we have planets that had them. Um, at least three in our own solar system, and it looks like there may be um, quite a few moons that, 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 that may have it. Io and Thales and, um, and, um, and Europa, that might, in fact, be, um, um, you know, have a great degree of water. And, of course, Titan, which um, if you look at it from a, if the image that's seen it, it's, and, and then image that, that planet, I mean, excuse me, that, that moon, it looks like a planet, but shores and everything else like that that almost look Earth-like, but yet they have, um, you know, methane oceans, you know, and uh, shorelines that look like something out, you know, from, from, from Southern California or something. It's, it's, I don't know what else to say, but, uh, you know, all of this is, is, is fascinating. And um, uh, I think the more experiment, you know, um, experimental trips we take and look around and find out what's, what's, on, what's on some of these moons and so forth, I think it's going to be... Um, it's going to be mind-boggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, you know, we, we've discussed this many times before. Um, you you got you to gotta take advantage of some of these, um, you know, some of these learning opportunities to actually get involved in this stuff. Um, yeah. You don't have to be a, a literal rocket scientist to actually be involved in this. Um, you have 
high school and um, and actually middle school um, students actually being involved in this type of stuff, uh, some of the research and some of the development. So to say that, um, you know, this can't be done or it's pie in the sky or it's a, you know, flat earth theory or something like that, you know, this is, um, this is a growing emerging market. There's no question about it. growing, not only is it a growing emerging market, but this is the future. This is, this is, this is, this is where things are going to be. So the future is being set now, you know, hundred years from now, your kids are going to be jetpacking on, 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 on the moon and Mars, you know, you know, flying around and having fun. Um, <laughs> this is kind of where we're at. This is where things are going. So um, uh, companies are already, are already stacking up and, and, and making moves. And as far as our community is concerned, the African-American community and, and, and young black children, this is perfect for us because our, our minds are, uh, kids are very intelligent and, and, and inquisitive, and this is something that's tailor-made for them. Um, tailor made, so we shouldn't we shouldn't be ignorant and um, and reptilian in this in this in this kind of, in, in this way and, and stay away from it and argue and and and, and, and say very stupid things and, and 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 not really understand what this does really mean because this is where, where the future of of our species is, is is going to be and it's being looted now. Companies are getting involved in developing technologies and so forth to get involved in this kind of thing now. This is. Immediate on us, immediate, immediate, immediate. If you had a baby today, you know, 20 years from now, they're going to be all over the place, the moon and everything else. Like that. They're going to be everywhere, you know, you know getting alive. And, and, and we should be a part of that. We shouldn't miss it. And, and we can't just say racism or whatever is, is going to keep us away. It's, it's going to come down to, to us being knowledgeable about it and us putting out this information and us helping uh, other youth get involved. This is, this is, it's not going to be about, you know, the white man held me back. You know, the white man got a son on my neck. I think we're going to have to look past some of this and really start to, to develop and, and function more responsibly right. as, as a community. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Right. No, and I, I, can't, dis- I can't disagree with you on um, – I, I, can, I can't agree more with you on this um, stuff that we've been beating the drum on for quite some time. So um, I also wanted to bring this up, too. Um, let me see if I can bring it up for you. Um, because you might have missed it. I'm not sure. Um. Oh, here it is. All right. Um. All right, this one is um, the future of AI researchers in Africa. I won't read the whole thing, but um, where did, where did it go? Oh, here it is. I'll just read the um, bottom last portion of it. It says that um, the main resource for doing research in ta- is talented people, and you will find more talent more talent in Africa than anywhere else. Says Cece, pointing to the disproportionately young population. The energy for tech here is just amazing. The question is, how do you equip those talented people with the skills so that they own the transformation of the continent in their, and build their own future? When CC teaches his students in the master's program, he tells them that in five years' time, they will be the ones leading in the field and returning to, the, returning to teach the classes of this, he has no doubt. The future of machine learning research is in Africa, he says, whether people know it or not. So, um, Africa being the uh, on the frontier of um, he said, I think it's Chinese. <laughs> it's so stupid. Uh, Black Uber strikes. Um, yeah, Black Rule, if you want to get on the panel, just let me know. We can uh, drop a link for you. But um, what's your take on Africa being the um, being the leaders uh, of of, uh, of tech right now, tech development? What's my take on it? Yeah. Yeah, my take on it is big because um, Africa's actually been um, moving very forward in, in, this, in this area for quite a while. You know, um, uh, I you know I did talk about Katanka and so forth, and 
how not only were they developing cars, but they were developing computing systems. And they actually, it is one scientist there now who's fearing, fearing for his life because they've been trying to steal this technology on, um, on literally type in the air keyboards where you don't need a physical keyboard. You can just type near the computer and you can actually bring up symbols just typing in the air without even using a keyboard. You don't need one. He's got that technology. Uh, IBM and them have been trying to steal it. He's been, he's been in hiding. He feels that the Europeans have been trying to kill him. Um, and uh, he's very worried uh, about it because he's come up with a cutting edge technology that nobody else really could grab. And he's trying to hold on to those patents. And I've seen some commercials where they tried to break out with this kind of stuff, the, 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 the white folks, but they, they've cut it back because there's some big issues now with respect to, uh, to copyrights and so forth. And um, he's worried, you know, these guys actually were fearing for their lives because they've been on this cutting edge for a while. And um, Dr. Um, Safo and them over there with, um, in, in Ghana who've been, um, who've been on top of robotics and so forth, where they can go to a computer, turn it on by blowing on it and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's just a lot. Of, it's just it's a lot of stuff's been going on that people wouldn't believe that they've been doing. And this may be shocking to some people, but those who are in the know know exactly what's going on. So yeah, Africa is definitely going to be a major leader in that. They've already started making moves, and um, you know, you're not hearing about it because people don't want you to know about it. They don't, they don't want you to know. You know, they don't, they don't want you to know. But yeah, they, they, they're they definitely going to be that. It's going to be even more so. And as they break out more and get a better handle on manufacturing that's going on and, and, and move forward there, it's, 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 it's going to be a wrap. So um, it's very important for us to, to succeed here to make, to make business connections there as well. Um, and that's the international thought process. I think we have to get out of some of our parochial thinking we have here in the United States and start to think a little bit more globally and start looking a little bit more towards the continent, even though it's been reported to be such a bad place and it's so negative and it's so terrible, um, of which there were a lot of lies. I remember when I first went over to Angola and I thought it was, oh, I mean, don't go to Angola, it's terrible, oh my gosh. You know, you know, so, you, know so, you know, Luanda and all that, it was one of the most, you know, it was a beautiful place, you know. So, I, you know, I see people lie and put a lot of information out there so you, so you don't go, but... It's important that we do make these connections. We talk about this a lot here in the Brain Trust. I don't want to you know, continue to beat, beat that horse. But, yeah, Africa is definitely going to be a, a, a major player. They're a player now, whether people understand it or not. And they're going to be a much bigger player in the future. That is for sure. And um, what, what Mike is saying is, is, is dead on the money. Um, and the articles are kind of are, are backing it up. And that's why you have the, the Russians, and the Chinese, and others who are in there. You know, trying to make moves. They they understand wh- wh- where the new wave is coming from. You know, the rapacious many many rapacious Americans and savages here are are, are looking to see how they can stop that. And um, you know, we have to play a role in, in, in getting in the way of that and taking advantage, um, not of them, but taking advantage of opportunities and us working closely with them. You don't have to love them, but work closely with them so we can um, uh, benefit benefit from it as well. Mike, I think you can kind of speak to the facts of um, how Af- yeah, you're talking to um, some African business people and they say that they really want to deal with us, that they would prefer to deal with us over anyone else. Would you expand on that for four minutes? Yeah, definitely. Um, met with some um, African um, uh, uh, business people and civil engineers and um, had a long conversation with them a few months ago and they basically said that um, African governments would like to do business with African American men or ADOS, but um, they don't have themselves together. They're not organized. Um, they don't operate as a single unit. So what's happening here is, um, you know, there's opportunities on the ground over there, but uh, if you don't have yourself together, you, you're going to be uh, left out, left behind. That's, that's pretty key. So we have, we have to think about that. And uh, there's a fourth industrial revolution in Africa, I believe, are not, are not looking to be left out of it. And, um, you know, we, we shouldn't be looking to be left out of it as well. Can we develop more here in the United States? Of course. But should we, um, you know, work there as well? Of course. 
you know, many groups that are intelligent and smart you, you make those connections from their homelands to their new home, to, to, to their new lands that they're in all the time. And it's, it's how we have to start to think. And it's, and it's beneficial for us. It's, it's, it's beneficial for us in, 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 in many ways. We can't look down on them and say, oh, these Africans, they, some, they dumb as fuck. They're stupid. No, you know, we hear people saying this kind of stuff. Fair enough. But at the end of the day, these guys are stepping up to the plate and doing quite a bit that is kind of earth shattering, as I said, in, in, in computing, in robotics, also in transportation and so forth. And um, none of us are very aware of it. And we should be more aware of that as well. And I think that's, that can only benefit us, not hurt us. Um, contrary to some of the um, absolute asinine stuff I, I hear. Well, waffling like a fart through the manosphere. It just, it just bothers me to hear some of this stuff. But, but anyway, go ahead. No, um, I see we have uh, another gentleman that has joined us, um, Complex Design. Hey, what's going on, everyone? What's good? What's good, Mike? What's good and gone? Complex. Much. Do you have anything you want to add to this, um, what we discussed over the hangout or? Uh, you know, I I missed maybe like the last fifteen minutes of discussion. I'm over here at my daughter's cheerleading, so I'm just I'm just chiming in now because I saw I now wasn't gonna be able to make it, so I wanted to try to get in as soon as I could. What uh what was what was what's been the topic over like the last ten minutes? No, we're just discussing you know the um the ability to work on the continent, what's necessary, uh, what you need, mm -hmm. as well as um, the stuff that we discuss on the black. Brain Trust, um, it's fundamental to, to uh, the fourth industrialization. Yeah, I mean, you know, all of, the, all of what we discuss is going to be foundational, right? Um, these are going to be the things that are going to be kind of like your, your A, Bs, and your Cs for, for pushing forward, um, you know, with fourth industrialization, you know, so you kind of have to abandon old ways, old inefficient ways, and adopt, like, these, these new methods and new technologies, you know, these are the all they all have to kind of be at the forefront. I'm just kind of just giving my, my general take on based on what you're, what you're talking about. Um, and it does also precipitate a different cultural mindset, right? As far as like your aims and objectives and what, what you're trying to do. So, um, you know, that's just my, my take on that. Um, you know, and what we talk about here largely is just it supports all of those points. You know, there's like a, a cultural change, um, a technological change. You know, um, all, all of those are going to be crucial for doing business on the continent, man. It can't be, you know, how we viewed it in the past, uh, because if, if we're going to continue to do that, then what will happen is, is that, you know, the Chinese will continue to just develop infrastructure in Africa and will largely be frozen out. Yeah, I um. I, I think this is the last, well, I shouldn't say I think, this is the last window opportunity, right? This is almost guaranteed. Um, if you don't, if you don't rack up now, if you don't stack up now in terms of um, your knowledge base, um, your cultural intelligence, your emotional intelligence, um, you're, you're going to, you're going to have faced some very hard times in the coming future. Um, just talked about Africa being the, being on the forefront of, of, of emerging tech. Um, just talked about the Chinese bringing together all of these uh, lower income countries into the space uh, space race, um, including the NIM on projects, including the Saudis on projects. You know, many people don't even realize that uh, the, the Saudis have a very well educated uh, class of people um, in terms of uh, the theocracy, but not. Um, not beyond the STEM, but now you're starting to see STEM development come out of it. You're starting to see um, the UAE, uh, Chinese brought Kenya in, they brought in South Africa and, and turn into the uh, space, into the uh, space development and space exploration piece. Um, there's so many areas uh, where people who either don't look like us or share some of our phenotypical features are, are just, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're popping a clutch and they're going. And yeah, you got people um, who who are here who are saying, you know, I'll, I'll wait for something else, you know, because uh, they believe in the system. They believe in the market. They believe in the capitalist system. They believe in democracy. They believe in the democratic process. They believe that this system 
it's always going to be there for them, despite the fact it hasn't done anything for them. And, and you know, the system, you know, the, the thing is that these things, they're not, these things aren't fixed. They're not static. Um, these things are like uh, changing and evolving at all times. Um, you know, so it, it's like, we can't, you, you have to have a, and, and you know, and I know this is kind of, this is always kind of attributed to a, a, a sort of like a political outlook, but as far as being progressive, right, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, uh, of the AOC type, not, you know, per se, right, that that's a, is a progressive in terms of like or your political view, but then there's just being progressive minded, you know, which is basically just understanding that everything every day that goes by there's some progress that's being take that's taking place so you cannot stay static and and a, a, and a mindset or in a form of thought right that'll have you thinking that well you know we should be doing this based on this even though the progressive mind says well whoa, 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 wait a minute you have this emerging technology over here that's soon to replace this over here so it wouldn't be prudent to to kind of hedge on things that you just know due to your comfort level you know it's not it's not it's not smart it wouldn't be prudent it wouldn't be wise to do that it would be wise to look to the future and say okay what's going to be commonplace there and we're we need to go ahead and hop on the trend train at that point and then move forward from there and then you start to create your you know your your um you know your global business objectives based on that you know, but but it, it does require abandoning a lot of uh, cultural norms and, uh, you know, the, these these cultural identifiers. Right. That kind of keep us locked in a in a in a, in a box that doesn't exist. Yeah. All right. Um, I I said I was going to get into this uh, tonight uh, before we close out the hangout, but um, I was going to save it for open chat. But I think I'll just use it, use the time right now. We have about twenty minutes left before we close out. Um, I begin a lot of emails about uh, um, IT mentorship and um, some of the discussion, and I, and I just wanted to um, kind of just lay it out, you know, in the last twenty minutes. I think people have to really understand you have to have a passion for certain things. And if you don't have that passion, it's not going to make any sense to do it. Um, how I got into cybersecurity is because I have an undergrad in information security myself. I also have a graduate study in, um, in uh, cybersecurity too. Um, but I've always been an IT person um, in, in my career. Um, security is just a was just another um, transition for me. Um, before that, I was into computer electronics. I did a, um, I did a computer electronics before IT and had had um, uh, some technical education in that as well. Um, I've always been into technology in some way, shape, or form. So for me, it wasn't that difficult to actually get into this because it was just a part of my passion of being involved in tech, everything tech. Uh, so with that being said, um, when we have these discussions about tech, um, it's it's something that you have to have some desire for, passion. Meaning, what's driving you? What's it, it can't just money can't be the only motivator because if money's the only motivator, then everything else is not going to work. Because you can get to the money only if you have that that drive and that drive is your passion and with with that comes um great opportunities um a lot of people think in the tech industry that um you know we just walk around you know with lambo money and stuff like that and that's not true um uh, far too often people are always or I should say people or black people are always looking at the dollar signs and not looking at okay so how do I leverage this opportunity to get to this next opportunity of where I want to be? See, there has to be some form of trajectory of where you want to be rather than how do I just get in just to get in, right? So there, there has to be 
passion and it also be there also has to be a trajectory of where you want where you're trying to get to um i knew when i was doing undergrad that um and i was doing um a lot of it work before i knew I, it was only a matter of time before i got to a um a net a um, network security position and from a network security into cyber security and then so on and so forth so i had to be patient going in you know to um in, into the industry I um, did a lot of networking, shook a lot of hands, did a lot of FaceTime with people um, at, at tech events and stuff like that. So I made my rounds. And as I made my rounds, that's what got me into the uh, role that I'm in today. Um, people are still waiting for a handout. You can't wait for a handout. you got to put in the work. Um, I tell people all the time, you know, in, in, on 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 the uh, on the panel and on the, and in the chat, um, you got to read at least 90, 90 minutes a day. Um, technical books, technical articles, um, just some really good websites. Um, you know, if you look at some of the the, uh, the articles in the docket, you, you look at some of the uh, art, the content that's being written. Um, a lot of that content is actually really fundamentally good content for you to read in your spare time because it's, there's some um, learning principles behind it as well, because it's going to lead to other other areas when they, when they hyperlink some of the other um, relevant discussions, uh, which is why we always put a docket in the description beneath the video so you can have further reading, supplemental reading as well. So you want to get to that next level, but you don't have the passion, it, it's never going to work. You can't say I have, um, you know, a degree in computer engineering, but you don't feel like doing computer engineering. That that's not compatible with, um, with, with the industry that you're trying to get into and the market you're trying to get into. It's just it's just incompatible. Um, so you got to make sure that this is exactly what you like to do. Um, and it's also important to to make sure you are connect with people who look like you, um, just as much as people who don't look like you. Because um, you want to build up that camaraderie, and and not just in your in your immediate circle, but on an industry scale. If I travel to, you know, um, a certain conference, there's people there that I'm going to see who's in the same industry as me, um, who's going to look out for me, and I'll, and I'll look out for them too. Um, looking out for somebody means that um, you speak highly of them. You know, when somebody sees. Me at a uh, at a tech tech event like I went to Black Tech Fest. Um, actually, let me share my uh, share the pictures too. Make sure I share these pictures. Uh, all right, give me a second. Well, Mike, while you're doing that, um, I, I want to just just kind of follow up a little bit <clears throat> as well. Um, you know, we are we are what we consume, um, and that includes information. You know, so um, and this is this is this is just me just making a, a blanket statement. It's not really it's not pointed at anyone particularly. Um, you know, but I, I was I was speaking I was speaking with what with, with a young brother yesterday, right? We were talking about motorsports and all that kind of stuff based off of the hangout that we had. You know, and, you know, he's explaining to me some of the things that, uh, you know, what he's skilled in, you know, what he's got certifications, degrees in and stuff like that, you know, but kind of looking how to angle it, how to take it somewhere, right? What to do with it, you know, and I say, well, you know, how, what's the what's the what type of information do you consume, you know, and it's, you know, if you've got like a lot of like, again, this, ain't, this isn't at anyone or anything, but it's just to illustrate, you know, so it's like if you've got. Just, uh, uh, you know, your, your, like your YouTube feed, for example, is just filled up with like, you know, quote unquote content creators, right? Talking about women and relationships and all that kind of crap. You know, that's what you consume. So that means that that's kind of what's prominent on your mind. That's what's important. And this is kind of what your reality will reflect versus if your feed is filled up with, let's say, so, so um, what Mike's talking about with coding for example, right? And, and, you know, cybersecurity and all that type of stuff. So if, if it's like, you know, you're not getting notifications like popping off on your phone from like free code camp, for example, or other YouTube channels 
where they deal specifically with you know python coding and and you know five what they they have this one site of five minute coding projects where you know you you throw like a little simple line of code together because all, it, what it's what it's meant to do is to teach you a simple concept in coding and they say okay just write this quick code and it's going to do this and here here's the here's the here's the basis behind this so things like that if those are the things that you then start to consume then those are the things that become prominent and then based on that you think about things more and then you start approaching problem solving, um, utilizing the information that 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 you are constantly consuming. So it, it, it's a it's a, it's like what Mike is saying. It's like a, a, it's a passion type of thing, where you have to have a hunger for it. And when you have a hunger for it, that means you're always going to feed yourself information that pertains to it, and then you're always going to think in terms of problem solving right based on how how the information that you consume that's going to precipitate how you go about approaching a problem you know so it's a it is it is very much a um a shift in mindset or or at least a, or not necessarily even a shift but a um just a, a change and and how what you consume the information that you consume and that that's going to basically set the tone for for how you how you go about uh, approaching this well, I always say garbage in, garbage out. Well, there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the the picture I'm showing right now is a um event I attended last week called Black Tech Fest. Um and this one's in Boston, but um you saw I saw a lot of passionate young black males up in there, uh, bachelor's degrees, double bachelor's degrees, some guys got master's degrees. Um, they work for Oracle. They work for, um, you know, uh, different tech organizations. That that's actually a tech organization that we're at right now. That we were at in that in that in that photo. Um, the woman that you see up front is the one who runs it, Melissa. Man, she's um, one of the dopest black women I've ever met in my life. Um, she's really she's really about um, you know social justice and the advancement of, of uh, black people, and that's why she created the event. Um, I happened to be there. Um, Gave you know stood up and gave my piece in front of the group. Uh, a lot of coders up in there. You know, there's this sort of perspective of what you know a, a black male nerd looks like. You know, it's always this sort of uh, um, Steve Urkel, Carlton Banks sort of perspective. And nobody in that room, none of the black men in that room, looked anything like that. These were very well um, distinguished brothers. Um, had themselves together, you know, graduate top of their class. These were no bums. And, and it's a shame that um, these guys don't get the representation, you know, in the in the black manosphere that they, sh you know, that other guys do, you know. Um, so I say well, Mike, all that they to do, say actually. that. Um, <laughs> I was going to say they do. They're called lames. Oh, yeah. That, 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 that's one thing. Um, I say all that to say that um, you, you if you don't have that passion, it's ne it's never going to work, man. Um, the industry isn't about money. Uh, I know guys who um, who, who I'm, I'm speaking of like non-black, um, not in ADOS, but Indian guys and um, Arab guys who um, they wear the same beat-up Converse every day, same you know uh, funny T-shirts and stuff like that. But they get shit done, man. They get shit done, man. And they they live on you know. 80% of their income and only 20%, they, you know, they use that for like, you know, sending back home or, um, you know, providing groceries for themselves and things like that. They, they live a very lean um, um, lifestyle. Um, they're not, they're not out there uh, balling or anything like that. So it's important to have that drive, but also be around other people and network with those people to understand you're not the only one that's out there. Um, not only do you have people who align with you, but you also have competition. You know, competition could be the same people that align with you. But you got to be able to, you know, come out of your shell and actually deal with other people who don't look, who either don't look like you or even ones who do look like you. These are very important factors in socialization um, in, in, in the tech industry. So wanting to go out there and, and, and um, wanting to go out there and, um, just make a whole lot of money. There's guys that I know right now making two hundred thousand dollars. You would you would walk past them and never know it. You know what I'm saying? Um, 
it's it's interesting when I see some of the emails come in and they're like, you know, I don't know what to do. Um, and, and that's fine, not knowing, but you got to be like, yo, I I, I want to write programs. I want to I want to write code. Um, I like the cloud. I like the idea of the cloud. Um, I, I like uh, um, you know, I I want to I want to write you know I, I want to get into uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, but you don't know anything about it. The fact that you want to get into it is actually a uh, a good position to be in because that's what's going to drive you into that into that market is, is the constant desire to, to um, and that hunger for the knowledge. And then you're going to come to some some place like this, like um, like a hangout tonight for space and technology, and you're going to be like, "Yo, I learned a lot just from hearing that article." Now, you know, we we gave you we gave gave you the links to EDX. We gave you the links to Udacity. Now now it's just up to you to actually sign up for it and spend that bread. Um, you got guys spending bread, you know, on super chats and stuff like that on other people's panels and, and they're not getting no return on the investment. Well, the, the return on the investment, Mike, is entertainment. You know, they're entertained. So I'm going to pay you, I'm going to pay you for the entertainment, right? But, you know, if you, um, <clears throat> I would always, I would always say like, if you're, if you're in a lurch, right? If you don't really know where to go or what to do with it, one, you, you, you apply it to a passion of yours. And then two, what you want to do is you want to solve a problem, right? I mean, what, cause what would be the point of applying it, right, in a venue or, or in, in, a, in a scenario, right, where it's not needed or it's not required? What value does it have if it doesn't actually provide a solution to something, right? See, so it's like stuff like this, the mindset is to either create efficiency, right, um, to improve something or to just simply solve a problem. You know, that, that's the kind of like that, that's really what tech, when you look at what tech, technology is used for, it's to, it, it's, it's a, it's a consistent upgrade of, of, of society and civilization. It's used to make things more efficient, to make things, you know, well, idealistically speaking, right? It's done to solve problems, to make things more efficient, to make things work better. You know, or it can be a whole new idea altogether. And, and also of ease of use, make things to be uh, um, um, ease of use and also to um, access certain types of um, strategies and, um, and different levels of communication and so forth that wasn't really, you know, available before. Um, I, I don't have a problem with people who have channels that want to do entertainment. You want to be entertainment? Go ahead. I don't have a problem with it. Um, there also should be other channels that are about, let's say, problem solving and, um, and um, providing some levels of certain types of, of, of solutions. It's not one solution to fit all things, but you know, there, there are many different types of solutions to different types of, of issues and problems in the technology. You know, the, 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 that's certainly what it's about, you know, developing you know, um, developing different types of, of technical strategies to um, to solve certain kind of problems. Here at this channel, that's exactly kind of what, um, what people really, um, I think this is what we should be providing or at least giving an idea where people can kind of mm -hmm. come and potentially, you know, look at that and, and talk about it or, um, or exchange ideas over this. And um, that's why this channel's here. I, I know some people get upset about some of the stuff we see other areas of the ministry with some of the ridiculousness that I see and some of the other stuff. It's, yeah, I, you know, I'm definitely not into that at this stage. But um, if people want to go there, you know, let them go there. But, you know, but there are alternatives. And this is the alternative as well. You know, uh, Real Raxons, he says in the chat, he says, you know, he, he wants to pursue his passions, but he also still wants to get paid. I mean, man, look, look, there's nothing wrong with that, man. I mean, that's, that's ultimately, that's the whole goal, really. Because, you know, if you if you're passionate about something, what's going to what that will ensure is that whatever it is that you undertake, there will be longevity in it because you're passionate about it. Like you didn't do it because it's just what people told you to do and you really don't have no interest in it. However, if you have a passion in something, you'll spend your own time, your own dime. You'll lose sleep. You'll do all of that because you're passionate about it. I do it with motorsports. Like we just had a whole hangout on Saturday about the shit. You know, and like I threw all kind of money at it, you know, sleepless nights and done all kind of shit, man. But, you know, what I ended up 
what I what I ended up uh, uh, you know achieving was a level of success at it, you know, and it's something that I'll never like abandon. So it'll always be something that I do, and I was able to make a business out of it, you know. So that's really what the whole thing about this is is you know you can you can pursue passions, but you have to you can't do it in ignorance, you know. You have to be smart about what you're doing. So you have to create models of, uh, of monetization into what you're doing. You know, that it, it, like, it's just, it's not just a simple, Oh, just go with the flow and the universe will through the, through the, the laws of attraction will bring the bullshit. No, it, you, you, you think it out and you have to create your lane for you, right? You have to work in your models of monetization and all that type of stuff, or even relegating it, Back to uh, what Mike was speaking on with regards to, um, you know, uh, tech, tech mentoring and all that type of stuff. And people, they, they see that what it is that we're discussing is going to be a large part of how things are going to operate and function going into the future. So it's like you don't want to be left in that wave. But at the same time, you do have to find a lane. So if, if, if a passion will be the basis of that, because, again, if it's a passion, if it's related in a passion, that means that you won't mind applying your own time and energy to it. It won't be a burden to you. Like you won't sit up there and be like, oh, I'm just fucking wasting my time and all this type of stuff. You'll do it because it's in line with a with a strong interest that you have. But there is an element of real worldism that, that goes along with this. You do have to monetize what you do. You do have to you have to take on a heightened level of seriousness about your approaches to things in life, the things that are going to that you want to pursue that are going to enrich you. And this is why I say, you know, go examine your YouTube feed after this after the stream is over. Go examine your YouTube feed and unsubscribe from all the shit that doesn't do anything for you. And then start seeking out all the sources of information on YouTube that would actually lend to you getting it into a better space uh in the areas of which you want to pursue and then start subscribing to all that shit and what you'll find is over the next 30 to 60 days like how you start to think and look at things will, will change and shift you know I, i've said this many times like get rid of a bunch of channels and then subscribe to like bloomberg cgnt euro news rt go 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 start subscribing to all these information bureaus and what will happen is is that all the stuff that we talk on these channels within 30 days you'll be abreast of everything that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with uh, Complex on that, um, as well as uh, Nagon. Um, you you got you to gotta, gotta channel your focus. I think there's a lot of, you know, a lot of black men who are in the stages of procrastination, and procrastination will be the uh, killer of your um, productivity. Um, yeah, you have a passion, but you're still trying to get paid. But the, the, the passion is what's going to get you paid anyways. So you never really hear me talk about how much money I make or what I, you know, what I spent my money on and this, this and that. Cause it's, cause at the end of the day, no matter where I work and no matter where I live, I'm going I'm to keep doing what I do anyways, because I have that passion for it. So it's not a big deal for me to uproot myself and, and, and move to, uh, you know, uh, uh, some part in Africa, like in uh, you know Mozambique or something. And, and as long as I got a laptop connection, man, a laptop and a, and a Wi-Fi connection, I'm good. I can do my job from anywhere. The, the problem I, I think some guys have is that um, they look at the money first before the passion, and and then they don't understand why they're not they don't feel fulfilled because they they put the money first. And then he said, well, now I, now I feel passionate. Well, no, you feel passionate to cast a check, but you didn't feel passionate to actually get it. And then that's only yeah, going to last for so long. Yeah, I, I just want to then, say here, I have, um, oh, yeah, 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 go ahead very quickly. Um, um, oh, that was, just on, that was just the only point. It was just following up on Mike because that's only going to last for so long. Right. Okay. You have a lot of people. I mean, look at it. Look at even like people who play like professional sports. Right. See, the whole goal was for them to go pro. Right. And get the big contract. Now, okay. now that they've gone pro and got the big contract, the average pro football player's career will last like last last like, last, like three and a half years. Yeah, that's it. About, about, four, about four years, three, four years. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and a lot of them don't even leverage their money right. You know, so, right. some exactly. Some are. 
it seems like the guys who are really leveraging their right. money the, the, the most efficiently are the um, are quite frankly are the Nigerian players. But anyway, um, uh, because they have a, a, a unified um, investment group and all that kind of stuff, so they're operating a, a, little, a little bit more above the curve. But I actually wanted to, you know, address this Terrence Forrest Jr. He said, um, "I currently, um, I'm currently, I'm I currently working. I'm currently working to um, to be an actuary, and I, and I want to learn um, blockchain um, to uh, to leverage uh, um, to, po- to possibly leverage um, uh, that knowledge for um, for finance." Uh, and, and insurance, yeah, it's pretty pretty crisp. I, I would say um, certainly blockchain is spoken a lot about here. Um, you have um, Lionel and, and 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 Mike who get into it, and of course um, uh, Complex who's big into blockchain as well. And, it's, and I have to say it's something I, I was somewhat knowledgeable about being in the financial industry, but but yet I've learned a lot from these guys. Um, um, a lot more about that here and just talking with them and, and being on a brain trust um, than almost in, in any other place. Of course, looking at some movies and reading some books and so forth, but, but it's just great, you know, really just um, going in um, with these guys and, and learning a lot. So, so yeah, it's a great channel to be at to really, to really, to really learn about um, a lot more about blockchain and, and really have these, getting involved in these conversations, um, um, Terrence, and certainly leveraging that um, in, in, in insurance and, and so forth, and, and I, I kind of understand the actuarial business, which is complex. Uh, mm-hmm. th- that's, that's that's a very interesting idea. And, um, but you you know you know, know, you know uh, we're going go ahead you know and, and I think uh, blockchain is actually the perfect application for something like an actuary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, and and, um, and I, I would yeah, it, that's exactly what it is, right? Yeah. So we're just talking about a new a new form of ledger system being applied to. A uh, to to a, a concept that's been used in insurance and in banking and all this type of stuff for shit centuries, centuries literally. Um, I would I would advise Terrence to to join uh, Lionel's blockchain study group because he and I were on the phone earlier today for like an hour and a half, um, actually putting the nuts and bolts together for a lot of how this is how we're going to try to work this because um some of some of the the, the blockchain study is going to so what we're going to do is is um and not to not to spill too many beans but the study group will then basically crescendo into some of the businesses that that brain trust members are we we so we we're we're we're, we're on the on YouTube we're an intellectual co-op and then outside of that we're also business partners um, we're, we're all, you know, we also consult each other. We do, we do a bunch of stuff offline too. See, so the, we, we, in our discussions, it's like, okay, what do we do with the blockchain study group? What, where does it go from after the concepts are acquired, the certification, the certifications are acquired, the knowledge is acquired, right? The skill sets are acquired, then what? Right? So then we, we then pivot to application. Now we're going to put it into use. And there's brothers that have businesses that can be leveraged on the blockchain. Okay. See, so, so I would highly recommend Terrence get involved or get at Lionel. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm on my phone, so I don't, I don't, I can't post Lionel's email address here at the moment. But if you can contact us through the channel or, or what have you, um, we're, we're, we're Lionel. I'm helping them put together kind of like the uh, the course um, the course infrastructure on how he'll accommodate. Uh, doing the courses, but things like an actuary, brother, like that is that is an amazing idea. Yep, yeah, I think that's a, I think it's, I think it's a great idea. That's, that's sharp thinking, and um, definitely um, say leverage uh, leverage the brain trust as well. Yeah, Christian is in the group. I mean, you can get at him too. I think I believe he's involved in it also. I think he just posted. So Maddox Twelve, if you want to get at him. He's involved in the project, also. Yeah, I, I, I think I just saw Matt just his comment where he um, said, you know, he's part of the uh, blockchain study group. So, yeah, it's a great place to be right now if you want to um, you get up on that because these guys are all over this blockchain like like no one else's business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that that was my take on on some of these emails that I'm seeing come in um, about IT mentorship. Um, Got to got to determine 
whether or not you're a um what your what your learning capabilities are are you a uh, hands on learner or are you a um theoretical thinker can you can you do you think better on your feet or or, or do you need to actually apply your knowledge to hands on development um in that regard, that means that you're a, a guy who could turn a wrench if you're a hands-on learner. If you are a guy who thinks on, on their feet or a person who thinks on their feet, um, you're, you're someone who can actually write code uh, for, the, for the most part. Or uh, if not write code, you can, you, you'll actually learn to write code quicker because uh, thinking on your feet uh, means that um, you're, you're pretty snappy. Uh, Terrence wants to know how do you, how do you contact you guys, so I think you should um, put the information in the. Mike, uh, can you post the? Let me, I don't. Yeah, okay, Mike. Let me go post ahead. my notes. Let me let me post my notes. Um, email. Because the, the study group will incorporate uh, certification courses, man. These will be things that you want upon completion. You purchase your certification documents from uh, EDX. I believe that's well, that's the platform he's going to be using. I mean, this is stuff that you'll be able to put onto your LinkedIn profiles, right, onto your resumes. Um, and then there's another blockchain organization that we'll be working with. I forgot. I, he was, man, we, we, we talked, we went in depth about a lot of this stuff today. We're trying to kind of lay, kind of put some stuff, some structure to what we're going to do here. And, uh, there's another organization that's involved. You'll also be able to utilize them, uh, on your LinkedIn profiles and stuff like that. So, you know, this, there's, there's going to be something that comes out of this, man, that will be able to take you a long way because you will have the certifications and you will have, the, the, it will be credentialed. All right, so with that being said, um, thank you all for joining us. Um, please hit the like button if you have not already done so. Uh, share the video if possible. And we'll be back uh, tomorrow for open chat.